All right. Well, I'm Jared Fossen here to welcome you to another episode of PDTV. And we are lucky enough to have the wonderful Katie Blunt here with us. Katie is one of our EdTech extraordinaire uh, specialists. And this week, and the reason that we've got Katie here with us is to talk about engaging assignments and activities. And I hear this term thrown out a lot right now in education, engagement and engaging activities and assignments and everything's got to have engagement in it. And I'm not sure we're all using the same definition. So Katie, I, I want to start out by asking you, what do you think it means to make an assignment engaging? Well, Jared, before we even dive into that question, <laughs> I think we have to back up a little bit to understand it because engaging assignments start with engaging instruction. I like how you I don't said think that. it's an yeah, I don't think it's enough to just say the assignment was engaging. So, let me talk a little bit about that. I think that engaging instruction starts first with clear learning intentions and success criteria. Um, if the students don't know what they're even supposed to be learning and what is expected in the lesson, it's hard for them to engage at all. Um, and going right along with that, having rubrics and exemplars so that students know when they get to that activity or assignment exactly what's expected. Um, I think that really helps them to engage. Also, a variety. <laughs> So you want to always keep a balance um, between introducing so many new things that your students are overwhelmed and never introducing anything new and they're totally bored. <laughs> so using a variety um, in your instruction can really help students engage as well. Um, multimedia can help in your instruction, whether it's using video to teach, especially if you're teaching remotely or in blended learning environments, but it could also be using video or audio for a hook in your lesson or an infographic that really clarifies your instruction and the key concepts that you want students to understand. Um, and then finally, I'd say that good instruction comes with collaboration with colleagues. Um, what are they doing that's working? That's really the point of a PLN or an impact team, not just to say my data stinks and what do we do about it, but to say, oh, your data is awesome. What are you doing that I could do to engage my students more fully? Yeah. And, you know, I want to go back to the point that you made right at the start with learning intentions and having purpose and meaning, because I don't think it matters what subject we're talking about. We could be talking about math, geography, science, English. When students have purpose and meaning to what they're doing, that helps make them engaged. Whether they have any passion for the topic itself, like it's that purpose and meaning that the teacher provides that really gets them engaged in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. One of the other things you mentioned was variety. And I'm gonna have you talk about that because I think a lot of times a teacher will come across like this cool app or maybe this great website and they're like they, they're like trying to jam that in there. Um, <laughs> but but I think there's more to it than that. So what do you mean by variety? Yeah. Well, variety can be created in a lot of different ways. For example, you can have variety in your groupings in a lesson. Maybe this time students are working individually. Maybe the next time they're working in small groups or having partner talks. Maybe it's a whole group or a whole class. <laughs> and so that can provide variety in the way that things are presented and make things feel fresh and new to students. Um, employing a variety of instructional strategies can help with the lesson. Um, giving students choice can also give them a lot of variety and engagement. Choice in path, pace, and place for their learning. Um, I can give you an example. <laughs> um, my next door neighbor is a kid who's in about fifth or sixth grade. He's been learning completely online for a while now. And I said, well, how's that going? Do your teachers use cool tools like Nearpod? And he goes, uh, Nearpod. <laughs> and I was like, 
wait a second, I think Nearpod's awesome and so engaging. Why is that his reaction? So I said, well, what don't you like about Nearpod? And he said, we do the same thing every lesson. Okay, class, go to the Nearpod. Here's a bunch of slides while I talk at you. And here's a quiz, a bunch of slides and a quiz. And I thought, oh, okay. So he is lacking and missing that variety, even with a really cool tool. <laughs> So I, I think that's a good example of you have to mix things up, keep students interested. Um, and I think we'll say this a lot, but finding the right tools for the right lesson, for the right student, for the right activity, and the right strategies for each of those as well. Yeah, I, I like that you shared a lot of different things about variety. It's not just the way that we present material. It, it can be the tool itself. I mean, you, you can have a really engaging tool like Nearpod, but if you're only showing it as a slideshow, then you might as well just use PowerPoint for that, you know? <laughs> but, and, and then I, I really like the end there where you said we've got to pick the right tool for the right activity. And I always think about golf. I'm, I'm pulling in a prop right here. You can Whoa, see. That's this, impressive. <laughs> this is my trusty putter. And the, the reason I like to talk about golf, I mean, I just like to talk about sports and golf anyhow, but uh, <laughs> with, with golf, it's so important that you have the right club for the distance that you are from the hole. And I'm not gonna pull the putter out and when I'm, when I'm teeing off my shot that's 350 yards from the hole, like that's not the right time to use the putter. Even though I like my putter and I, I'm pretty good with my putter, that's not the right place for it. And, and I think sometimes with digital tools, like we can fall in love with certain tools and we wanna use them all the time, but if they're not matching our meaning and our purpose, our learning objective, then we're not, we're just, it's, Ill fit, it's an ill fit, right? It's not the right time or place to be using it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, thinking back to what I said about strategies, I think the same analogy works. If every time you're giving students an opportunity to respond, it's always pair share, pair share, pair share, pair share, every single time you're using the putter every single time, you know, um, but maybe it, again, it needs to be a group um, thing or it needs to be a structured classroom discussion, or maybe this time they're just writing in a journal or typing into a near pod. Same idea, right? Variety, choose the right thing for the right time and the right lesson and the right place in the lesson. <laughs> you know, we've talked about learning objectives and building culture. Katie, what would you say is the next step in creating an engaging lesson? Well, I think that using an instructional framework is a great next step. Um, frameworks can help you ensure that your lesson has the components, the, the best instructional practices that are most important. I know a lot of districts have their own instructional frameworks, so use those, dive in. Am I doing the things that are listed here as being most effective? Um, but one example that I've probably seen throughout these district frameworks um, that has become well known in the education world is the four C's. Um, and so the four C's are communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. Um, so when I've created a lesson or maybe it's even a series of lessons, I can look through those before teaching and ask myself, am I giving students the opportunity to communicate? Are they sharing thoughts, questions, ideas? Then I can say, do they have opportunities for collaboration in this lesson? Are they working together to reach a goal? Are they putting all of their individual talents and expertise and smarts to work together? Um, do they have opportunity for critical thinking, to look at problems in new ways, uh, to link across different subjects and disciplines? And then creativity, am I giving them an opportunity for creative expression? And you know, I, I think creativity and I think, oh, well then they've got to paint a picture or take a photo or make a video. And all of those are awesome. <laughs> I love photos, videos, all of that. But really at the heart of it, it's about trying new approaches. 
new approaches to um, express um, thoughts and ideas, to demonstrate mastery, or to solve problems. It's about innovation and invention. So using some of those frameworks as a checklist for the lesson that you've created can really bump up that engagement level. Yeah, and I think the four C's is great and, and what a great checklist to have, you know, are my students critically thinking, you know, during this lesson, is there an opportunity to be creative? And like you mentioned, creative doesn't mean just drawing a picture. There's lots of options with creativity. And then are they collaborating and communicating with one another? Fantastic. Um, another framework that I like is TPAC, and this is one of those loaded acronyms that's actually <laughs> way better as TPAC than what it really is, because it's technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge. <laughs> that's a lot to say and remember. But, but the thing that I really like about it is it's all about the intersection between technology, good teaching and pedagogy, and the content itself. And, and how do we mesh that together um, appropriately and in the, in the best way for our students to learn. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and TPAC really helps teachers evaluate and make thoughtful decisions about where to allow the student choice we've talked about, what mastery will look like, how to assess that mastery. And as you said, ensuring that the pedagogy and the content is there before you try to decide what tool best serves the lesson. So speaking of tools, and we've We're held off finally... until the very end to talk about tools. We did. We're going to finally talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> we've done that intentionally. <laughs> So Katie, what tools have you found that allow for really good student engagement? Yeah, well, my first set of go-to tools comes from the Google Tools for Education, um, especially when they're integrated into Canvas using LTI assignments and, and they're embedded into that LMS. So um, Google Docs is the first one that comes to mind. And when I think about Google Docs for an engaging assignment, I instantly think of essays, writing assignments, and of course, this is a great use of the tool, especially if you're utilizing things like comments and editing mode to give feedback and peer reviews and collaborate. Um, but there are also some tools in Docs that sometimes we forget about, some of the research tools that are embedded. Um, and I'm going to show an example where we actually used the table tool to create a graphic organizer within Google Docs. In this example of a Google Doc, you can see that I have added a table to provide students with a graphic organizer that they can interact with. So not only is the graphic organizer itself very visual, but it provides spaces for students to respond and engage with the assignment. And if you consider that you could give this graphic organizer to the students before they read the article, or perhaps in preparation for a second read through, um, they will engage even more with the article itself because they know what they're looking for as they read. So forms is another great Google tool that can be used in a variety of ways in the classroom. Um, quizzes, surveys, but I love to use forms for exit tickets so I can gauge student learning where are we at before we move on. Um, slides is another great tool. I, I think it's maybe the best known for engaging activities. <laughs> because it's so easy to create um, presentations, reports, group or class projects, so much can be done with slides. Um, but perhaps one of the lesser known or lesser utilized Google tools is Google Draw. Google Draw is great for engaging activities and assignments. Um, I actually found a list of ideas and templates for using Google Draw in the classroom on Matt Miller's Ditch That Textbook blog. Um, his ideas include using Draw for creating posters, comic strips, digital manipulatives. That's actually one of my very favorite ways to use Draw is to have students actually move images and use them as manipulatives. 
Um, and I um, found some really great templates and I'm gonna show you one of them now. This one is the, it's a graphic organizer for practicing vocabulary. Here's an example of a graphic organizer that was created in Google Draw. I really liked this paint chip vocabulary idea in addition to how they utilized Google Draw for the assignment. So as the instructions say, the purpose is to um, input vocabulary words into each of the boxes below and students or the teacher ahead of time can click in there and type those words. And then they are assigned to find five synonyms for each word and add them in order of richness. So the more rich the color on the paint chip that they've created, the richer the synonym for the word should be. And they provide an example and they've provided the example off to the side in Google Draw, which is a great way to provide extra things that aren't really part of the assignment. Um, for example, you can see I've also added an image off to the side here. You could have a whole series of images off to the side that then students click and drag to match something on the main assignment. Um, students could also add their own images by going up to the insert image and searching the web, which brings up this nice little search on the right hand side and type in whatever they search for. So you could have them determine an image that really represents the vocabulary word very well. Um, I like to include PNG or transparent in my image searches for Google Draw so that when I add the image, it can go right on top of whatever the background is and have that nice transparent background. Um, Another example is to use Google Draw for math manipulatives. So just like I was moving that light bulb around, when you create a Google Draw that has, for example, algebra tiles, this one by Alice Keeler, and students can move those all around, either following along with a live lesson, maybe on a video chat, or following along on their own to a pre-recorded lesson that you have um, put into Canvas, for example. So those are a couple of examples of using Google Draw for some engaging activities. All right, well, that was a fantastic example. I, I like that a lot. And speaking about Google and, you know, documents, one of the things you can do is create a hyperdoc. And that's kind of, that's a fun word to say. Yeah. And like just just hearing ADHD like, hey, we're gonna kids? we're gonna look at this hyperdoc today. Like that's that's exciting for students. Like <laughs> that's engaging right there. But basically, what we're doing with that is we're allowing a lot of student choice. We're allowing for creativity within these um, hyperdocs, so that it's not just this worksheet that students are getting. That there, there's a lot more to it. And let's take a look at an example of a hyperdoc. Here's a quick look at a hyperdoc. In this case, we're seeing one on Utah's online library. And you can see that as I click into this, each one of these, in this case, activities is going to take me to another page that will allow me to do something. Um, I can also click here and then add my submission in this case this is going to a Padlet. And so each one of these activities has a different link to it, but you can see just a really nice, clean look on this hyperdoc. And then it allows the, in this case, the student to make choices. The teacher can also make choices on how they want to do things. And just a lot of options here. You can also link websites and really the possibilities are endless with hyperdocs. They're a fantastic tool that you can use. We're gonna talk about Nearpod, which I think is a fantastic tool, really one of my favorites, because it has so many options within it. It does not have to be just a slideshow. In fact, I like to describe Nearpod as, this is what students wish that PowerPoint or Google Slides was, <laughs> or is, 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 is Nearpod, because you have tools like collaborate boards, um, being able to draw on slides. You can put out an informal poll really quick and, and check the assess, uh, understanding of your students. 
You can quiz them. You can have short answer questions. You can have a slideshow in there. You can put in videos. You can add a sway. You can have FET simulations and virtual field trips. Like, and the great thing about it is all of this is easily integrated into Canvas. So let's take a look at an example of a Nearpod that I got from the Nearpod library. Nearpod that I added to my library from the uh, Nearpod library. So it wasn't one that I had to create, but I did add a few things to it. So you can see here that there's different slides and this one is web content, that's from Nearpod. There's a slideshow here which has you know, different slides on it. I added this poll and another poll and then you can add things like a draw it. There's a virtual field trip where the, these have been made, in this case in Zion National Park, that'll take you to different parts of the park. Then I added another draw it here. You can put in a, a different website, you can add a quiz, open any question, have a collaborate board. Like there's so many options with what you can do in Nearpod to make things engaging for your students. Give it a try if you haven't already. I love it. There are so many options there, Jared. Um, there are also a lot of other tools that can create engaging student activities. Some of these do have Canvas LTIs and can be embedded right into Canvas, but some don't. And even if they can't be used with an LTI, they can usually be embedded or at the very least linked in a Canvas page. So you're still having students at least start in that LMS they're familiar with. Um, but let me give you some examples. There are tools including Flipgrid, Padlet, Quizlet, Google Maps, Google Earth, all kinds of video and animation tools, interactives on Utah's online library, Breakout EDU, Lucid. Hey, whoa, whoa, and whoa, 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 Katie, you just mentioned so many tools. <laughs> My head is going to explode. Oh no. <laughs> like, I think we hit that overload moment. <laughs> I think you're right. I, I just got so excited about <laughs> Well, it tools. is exciting. But but I think, uh, you know, we, we do need to consider, like, are our students ready for another tool? Are our parents ready for that? You know, b before we throw one out there. <laughs> you know, may and, and like you mentioned, is this something that they can add into Canvas already, like a Nearpod? And, you know, another thought is, are you maximizing the tools that you're already using? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back off a little bit. I'll slow down. <laughs> um, I know I overwhelmed you, but in addition to everything that you just said, I think it's important for teachers to remember that they're not alone. <laughs> they don't have to... Um, create all of these different experiences and different tools all by themselves either. So when they do decide, I think we can add one tool. I'm going to teach my kids how to use it and get them super comfortable with it. You don't have to build everything yourself. So for example, <laughs> we mentioned already collaborating with colleagues and with teammates and using things they've already built. Um, remixing things if they're not exactly what you want. Um, exploring libraries. Most districts have a school or a district Nearpod library, for example. Um, and eMedia is great for that. So here's another shameless plug for eMedia, right? That's the whole point of eMedia is to find things that other people have created that you can use save yourself the time and the effort you can remix things and then once you're comfortable you can actually then contribute back to the community and submit your own lessons and your own um, creations and templates as well so let me give you just a real brief tour of eMedia to help you find some of these resources that already exist for engaging assignments eMedia really is a great resource to join um, the Utah education community in sharing resources so that we don't have to feel alone and feel like we have to recreate everything ourselves when we're teaching. When you get to eMedia.uen.org, you can click on the search tool 
and go ahead and search a topic that you've been studying in your classroom or that you have upcoming. And when you click search, you'll see a list of resources that are related to that topic. These resources can be just about anything. Uh, a lesson plan like this one here, or a video, or a Nearpod lesson, um, a professional development training, whatever. And then you can click on it and learn all the details about that resource and decide if it's something that you would like to use. You can rate the resources um, so that others who participate in eMedia know what you have considered the best of the best. <laughs> and if you find something that's almost what you want, but not quite, you can even remix that resource to make it your own. And then you can give back to this community as well. When you create those dynamic and engaging activities, assignments and lessons and videos, you can come to eMedia, click create and author a lesson plan or submit a resource from the web so that others can benefit from the community and from your work as well. Um, one more tip is you can actually click the search and type in lesson plan template and when you search that, you'll find the UEM lesson template that you can remix and it's already got instructions for including all of the most important things that make a lesson plan complete and rich and engaging. Okay, well that was fantastic. It, you know, you brought up so many great points there and it's nice to take a, a look at eMedia. Some of you may not have been in there for a while or maybe you've never been in there and it looks quite different than it did before. And you know, yeah. the idea okay. there being like, you don't have to recreate anything. You can go find something and then creating that uh, community by adding things when you're comfortable doing that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Let's recap what we've talked about today. We, we have talked about quite a few things with engagement. And I, I think it's key to remember what you said at the very start, and that is that engaging assignments start with engaging instruction and that means that they have to have meaning and purpose to them then we've got to build that classroom culture that's going to allow the connections and the collaboration that we want our students to have using a blended framework like tpac or the four c's can really be a great checklist for you to make sure you're covering all your bases and then finally Pick the right tool for the job. Don't do that first. <laughs> do that after you've done all this other stuff. And then it'll be easy to know which tool you should use. And you won't be overwhelmed because there's so many tools out there. You'll know, okay, this is this is where I need to use Nearpod or Google Docs or HyperDocs or you know one of the other tools that we've mentioned. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Katie. My pleasure. We appreciate your expertise on this subject and hope that all of you out there will, you know, take the time to make your assignments a little bit more or maybe a lot more engaging for your students.